hello there. <laughs> Muy buenos días, mis amigos. How's it going, everybody? Welcome to D&D Optimized, part of the D4 network. This is the show where each week we take a deep dive into one, sometimes two, specific character builds for Dungeons and & Dragons, and we crunch numbers about them, we theorycraft about them in the effort not to tell you the right way or the best way necessarily to play a character, but to try to build a character that is both really fun and also powerful in game. So if you enjoy creating characters for D&D almost as much as you enjoy playing the actual game itself, then welcome home. This is absolutely where you belong, and I am really, really happy that you're here. So thanks for being here. My name's Colby, and I'll be your host. Before we jump in, as a public service announcement, if you would like to have a written step-by-step -step guide to this and all, I should say, most of my other builds, because there's a backlog that I haven't gotten to yet, but anyway, um, please consider joining the channel as a member. For $2 a month, you get access to my library of write-ups, which I create for each episode. Uh, so you can have like a level-by-level -level guide to recreate the character yourself if you would like. Uh, more importantly, I think for most of my uh, members, it's a great way to support the channel and help me create more and better content. So thank you. And even if you don't join, thank you anyway for being here, for liking, for subscribing, and all the other things that, uh, that help me out. Huge thanks to everyone who went and subscribed to the Tales of Anaria channel. That was a really big help. Thank you, everybody. We're hoping to continue growing, so if you like watching other people play Dungeons & Dragons, feel free to check us out over at Tales of Anaria. And, um, you know, also, another plug for the merch shop. I'm wearing a fantastic hoodie. Uh, that I ordered off of our off of our merch shop. So check the video description if you're interested in supporting us that way and having some nice comfy clothes. It's actually like really soft. This is my new favorite hoodie, and not just because of my narcissistic pleasure at seeing uh, the D4 logo on a piece of clothing, <laughs> though I'm sure that's part of it. All right, let's jump into the build. So you want to play a bruiser in D and D like a boxer maybe or a wrestler or maybe more like an mma you know mixed martial arts or ufc champion type character in dungeons and dragons um you don't want to be a lithe dexterous martial artist no you want to be a brawler a scrapper a bare knuckle puncher a fist fighter can such a character concept be made viable rules as written in D&D 5th edition. I've had a surprising number, actually, I think, of requests for what a lot of you call a strength-based pugilist, <laughs> which I love because it feels very, like, old-timey. Put em up, put em up. I love the concept, but I'm gonna warn you, D&D 5e doesn't make it very easy for non-weapon using martial characters, in case you didn't know. Many of you are familiar with the challenges that monks in particular face along these lines, and monks at least get to use weapons for some of their attacks anyway. But that's not what you want. You want no weapons. Fists and elbows and knees and foreheads, a nice Pile driver to the face. Okay, maybe some wrestling, but I'm guessing more Conor McGregor and less Nacho Libre, right? And definitely for this build, not like Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Okay, fine. So we're going to do then one of those characters that's not so much make the most powerful character in the world and a little more take this really cool, fun, interesting character concept and see how good we can make it while staying within these boundaries that we've created for ourselves in the name of character and story. I can dig it. I love those kind of characters. Your damage just isn't going to be amazing. I'll do the best I can, but unless you can pick up some house rules along the lines of, like, my friend uh, Triant Monk's recent video on three house rules, uh, which I really loved and highly recommend, can I link to another channel's videos with a card? Survey says... <coughs> anyway, house rules that give a little, like, potential buff to unarmed strike users. You're going to have 
I think, a very hard time competing on a damage basis to weapon and or spell users. Now, speaking of weapons, let's address this other elephant in the room problem right at the onset here that you're potentially going to run into with this character. Resistance from enemies to non-magical bludgeoning, piercing, or slashing damage. A lot of enemies in D&D, of course, have said resistance in 5th edition, especially as you get a little bit higher level. And as I see it, there are very few ways around it. One, we could pick up three levels of Ascendant Dragon Monk that will let you make your unarmed strikes elemental damage of a type of your choosing. Two, six levels of monk will let you make your unarmed strikes just magical for the purpose of overcoming resistance to non-magical bludgeoning damage. Alternatively, you could pick up a couple of specific magic items like Eldritch Claw Tattoo or the Insignia of Claws. I love both of those. My favorite alternative might be to just like try and convince your DM to reflavor any magic weapons that you find to be like, say, magic brass knuckles or something instead of a magic longsword. Maybe at least just for like your attack action attacks. My friend and DM Corey did this for me on the first character that I made that was like my body is the only weapon I need character. And it was, it was very great just for pure flavor. Some of you may feel like that's cheating a little bit, but like I say, Wizards of the Coast doesn't make it real easy on unarmed fighters in D&D. So much of the power that characters get as they gain levels comes in the form of magic items for much of us. And for martial characters in particular, that usually means magic weapons. And so yeah, I don't know why your DM wouldn't let you take that flame tongue longsword and call it the flame tongue knuckle wraps or something like that, so that at least you can try to keep up damage wise with the other martial characters in your party. But I'm not going to assume any of those things when I crunch the numbers for this character. I just want you to make sure that you talk over all of these things with your DM before you try to bring this character to the campaign. Make sure that between the two of you, you have a solution to the way to deal with magical resistance because my impression is that most of you who have requested this character concept specifically do not want a monk. but. If there's no guarantee that you'll be getting a magic item to help you out, you might have to take at least three monk levels to be viable once you get past level six or so. Now, we're going to try to create this character for sustained damage, but again, because we're fairly limited by the rules and how far we can stretch that damage, I think we need to plan on bringing something more to the table than just damage. And frankly, every character in D&D, in my opinion, should probably bring something more to the table than just damage, with maybe a few exceptions. I think the thing that makes the most sense and still fits thematically is to make them not just a puncher, but a grappler too. In true like MMA fighting style fashion, because the best MMA fighters don't just punch and kick really hard, right? They get in close, they get the enemy on the ground, they put them into submission holds, uh, stuff like that. Grappling in D&D can be a very nice form of control, and maybe even more than that, depending on what we do with them once they're grappled. So I'm gonna build this character both for unarmed striking and grappling, so we can add some nice control to the build in addition to the damage that we'll be doing with our fists and knees and elbows. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's get ready to rumble. I present episode 75, The Street Fighter. And as usual, check out this fantastic artwork by my good friend Randall Hampton. He creates artwork for the character concepts for most of my character creations, and he always does a fantastic job, and the case is no different with this fine piece here. I love it. And so, yeah, thanks as always to Randall. If you would like to follow him, please check out links on how to do so in the video description. Let's jump in. At level one, for our class, we're going to start with monk. <laughs> Did I just say I wasn't gonna do a monk build? Ah, the old bait and switch. Okay, so yes, like I said, a lot of people who have asked for this type of build specified that they didn't want a monk. I promise I won't be here long. We're really only here for one thing, but I think if you're going to make an unarmed fighter and you're really trying to maximize your damage output as much as you can, you'd be crazy to skip at least one level of monk here. And more, like I've said, if overcoming non-magical resistance is going to be an issue. So yes, for us, when we first meet our champion, they are sequestered in a monkish monastery. They might actually be there against their will, I think. Or, well, okay, so they have this vision of becoming a great fighter, honing their body to use it as a weapon, but 
things aren't going quite right for them. Perhaps the monastery is trying to teach them like the way of the leaf, and our hero is maybe a little better suited for the way of the fist. A little more Cobra Kai, a little less Miyagi-Do. There is way too much mercy in this dojo. There's this rage inside them that just isn't quite gelling with what their master is trying to teach. So, as for our race, I want to recommend starting Mountain Dwarf. In my opinion, for this build, there is no feat more valuable than stats. And we are going to be a bit mad, uh, multiple ability score dependent, so I'm going to recommend taking Mountain Dwarf here, as Mountain Dwarf will get you a plus two to two stats of your choice, if you're using updated rules from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything anyway, which is unique among all races. You also get some resistance to and advantage against poison, among other things, which is nice. As for ability scores, I always assume the point by method, and so I would recommend taking a 14 strength, taking a plus two there, a 14 constitution, taking a plus two there, so we've got 16 in both of those, then a 14 dexterity, and a 13 wisdom. The big downside to the monk dip is that it does make us, like I say, pretty mad. We're going to want dexterity and constitution anyway for our armor class because as an MMA type brawler, I think it makes the most sense thematically to go unarmored here. And it's not a terrible option for us mechanically either if we build right. And as for wisdom, it's always good to get a decent wisdom score anyway for saving throw purposes. I just wish I could have gotten it to a 14 as well because odd numbered ability scores in D&D just make my eye twitch. As for equipment, I'm gonna recommend taking the gold buy option and just treat your friends. <laughs> I mean, honestly, one of the great things about this build is you don't really need any equipment at all. I mean, some clothes, I guess, and maybe like a backpack or something, but uh, some rations. Otherwise, yeah, dinner's on me, everybody. And then as a monk at level one, we get unarmored defense. Now, the monk's version of unarmored defense isn't fantastic for us, but basically we're told that so long as we're not wearing armor or using a shield, our armor class equals our dexterity modifier plus our wisdom modifier. For us, that's not fantastic right now. It's only a 13, but it will get better soon. And then we also get the martial arts feature, and this is really the main reason that we're here. One big problem with unarmed fighting in 5e is there's no way, rules as written, to get an attack with your fists as a bonus action outside of being a monk, so far as I know. Correct me if I'm wrong, and I know that you will, so yes, we want extra attack, of course, to get two actions on our action, but the biggest bump to our damage, if we're committed to just using unarmed strikes at level one anyway, will be to dip monk, or else we'd be stuck with a single attack per turn until we got extra attack from somewhere. As a monk, however, with martial arts, we're told that as long as we're unarmed and unarmored, basically, we can use dexterity instead of strength for unarmed strikes, which we won't be taking advantage of here. Can doesn't mean must. We can roll a d4 for our unarmed strikes instead of just one plus our strength modifier like everyone else, another great reason to start monk. And then yes, if we take the attack action and attack with an unarmed strike or a monk weapon of course, which we won't be doing, we can make another unarmed strike as a bonus action. So right off the bat, we're getting two attacks per turn instead of one without needing a feat or weapons to do so. And the nice thing is that we get to add our ability score modifier to the damage here, something that like a two weapon fighter can't do unless they take a fighting style for it, right? But then at level two, our budding brawler has had enough of the monkish way of life, I think. They may have had a falling out with their master. Uh, perhaps there was an incident where they lost control of their emotions and destroyed something in anger or seriously hurt another student. Maybe something in your past, like a traumatic event perhaps, or just the way that you were raised even, is making you feel really incompatible with the teachings of your monastery. And so whether you leave on your own or you were forced out, you leave in a frothing rage. Whatever your reasons, we're taking barbarian levels here. For a lot of great benefits, actually. First up, rage. With rage, as a bonus action twice per day for now, you can enter a state of rage so long as you aren't wearing any heavy armor, and you gain the following benefits. You have advantage on strength checks and saves, this is important later. You have resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage, which, as I've pointed out many times on this channel, tends to be the majority of the damage that most players in most D&D campaigns will take throughout their career. So that's really nice. It's very good for a character who will never have an amazing armor class. And then when you make a melee weapon attack using strength, you can add 
2 damage to the attack, which eventually scales with more Barbarian levels. And just in case you're wondering if Unarmed Strikes qualify here, they do. In the Sage Advice Compendium, we are told that unarmed strikes count as melee weapon attacks, despite not being weapons. So, right off, we get some really nice defensive utility and damage bonuses from Rage. The one big drawback with Rage, of course, is that you can't concentrate on or cast spells while raging, but I don't envision this character as much of a spellcaster, so that doesn't bother me too much. They're a pugilist, boxer, grappler, right? Not a spellcaster, so I'm not too worried about spells here. It's worth the sacrifice for this character concept. We also, as a Barbarian 1, get Unarmored Defense. Wait a second, didn't we already get... Yes, we did. It's, it's a different version of Unarmored Defense, and frankly a little better than the Monk's version, particularly for this build, in that it lets you add your Constitution modifier and your Dexterity modifiers together for armor class purposes if you're unarmored. And it even allows you to use a shield, but Using a shield would prevent us from using martial arts, meaning no bonus action attack, and besides, it just that just doesn't really fit the image I have in my head for this character using a shield, uh, being kind of this MMA fighter type, right? Anyway, now we would be at a 15 armor class and only taking half damage most of the time, as long as we're raging anyway, so we're in a much better place defensively. At level three, we would be a Barbarian two, and we get Danger Sense, first of all. This gives us advantage on dexterity saves against things we can see, like traps, spells, etc. And that's pretty nice, actually, especially since we started as a monk and thus have proficiency in dexterity saving throws, meaning we should succeed more often than not on what's arguably the most common save you're going to have to make in the game, despite the fact that we're not really prioritizing our dexterity score. The real gem of Barbarian level 2, however, is Reckless Attack, of course. So now, when we make our first attack on each turn, we can decide if we want to attack recklessly, thereby giving us advantage on all melee weapon attacks, like unarmed strikes, this turn at the cost of granting our enemies advantage on attacks against us until our next turn. The question you may have is, when should I use this? The answer, in my opinion, is basically all the time. <laughs> I mean, our armor class isn't that great, it's never going to be great, so we're going to get hit fairly often regardless of whether the enemy has advantage, and we will have resistance to most of that incoming damage, anyway. Maybe against like really easy to hit targets, you might want to think twice, or if you're super low on health and the enemy chance to hit isn't all that high or something. But generally speaking, you're a barbarian, be a barbarian, right? Let that inner rage out, throw caution to the wind, the best defense is a good offense, etc, etc. No regrets. At level 4, alright, this is the point in the build that I really agonized over for a long time, and I crunched a lot of numbers. <laughs> I'm gonna go here in a direction that many of you are not gonna agree with, I think, so let's have a little chat about it. Arguably, our number one priority with this character at this point would be to get extra attack, right? It's definitely the thing that's going to increase our damage the most. The very difficult question for me became, where do I get extra attack from? Now, the somewhat obvious answer might be three more levels in Barbarian, and that's not a bad option. You'd pick up another Rage use per day, we're going to want to get that eventually. You're going to get a subclass, you'd get an ability score increase or feat. The problem is, for me, as I've said in past videos, Barbarians just don't scale all that well in my opinion. They're fantastic for a multi-class dip if you're not planning on casting or concentrating on spells in combat, but otherwise, after level 5 especially, I think, they're just a little lackluster. So I'm really loath to put more levels into something now that I'd just be abandoning later and feeling like I'd maybe kind of wasted those levels a little bit, or at least that I could have done better by investing early into something else. That said, in a campaign that was going to end at like maybe level 6 or level 8 around there, yes, I would absolutely stick with Barbarian here. What about Monk? On the one hand, you could get key points, you could get Flurry of Blows, letting you make yet another unarmed strike on your turn. And for someone focused on unarmed strikes, that's clearly the way to go, right? Eventually, you'd get extra attack and Flurry of Blows, giving you four attacks per round. Amazing. The problem is this. Flurry of Blows costs a key point, as you probably know, and I'm trying to build a sustained damage dealing pugilist here. I mean, I suppose that once we had, say, six or seven levels of monk, I could kind of assume that we'd be able to use a key point once per turn for an entire 
combat encounter at least once per short rest. But then we get into a similar situation where we've invested a lot into a class that, as much as I love them, my favorite class in the game, in reality also just doesn't really scale that well. Plus, there's the earlier issue that I mentioned of not really wanting this character to be heavy into monk. Less a martial artist and a little bit more boxer brawler, right? And not only that, but for this character, we haven't really put enough investment into wisdom to make cool monk features like stunning strike even remotely viable. I think if you're gonna go monk, you either just dip your toe in as we've done, or you go all in or mostly all in. I just don't think it's right for this character. Check out my Mercy Monk build if you want what I think is probably my best monk character to date. But if we want something that scales a little better throughout our character's career, that gives us some nice benefits now and some even better benefits later, not to mention more ability score increases than any other class. And as I said, we are desperate for ability score increases on this character, not to mention something important that's going to help us be a much better brawler grappler. I think our best route here is to go fighter. We're gonna take that discipline that our monk master was trying to teach us from the monastery, couple it with the rage that we've been feeling deep down inside that really fuels us and fuse them together with a class that's focused a little bit more on technique and skill. And if you're asking why we don't just start fighter to rush to extra attack first or maybe go monk one and then fighter five or barbarian one and then fighter five i've crunched the numbers for all of the above and doing either of those things would give us either slightly better damage with worse survivability or slightly worse damage with similar survivability at least at level six so i've opted to delay that extra attack as painful as it is by going fighter we are going to pick up some other things that are helping us add damage we do already have two attacks per round with our level one in monk so anyway this is our path Feel free to choose a different route if you would like. But as a fighter, at level one, we get second wind. This lets us, once per short rest, as a bonus action, heal ourselves for 1d10 plus our fighter levels. That's nice. And then we also get a fighting style. And we are, of course, going to go with the unarmed fighting style. This is really a pretty nice fighting style. It's perfect for us, of course. It makes our unarmed strikes a d8 now instead of a d4, so long as you're not using a weapon or shield in either hand. And then also, at the start of your turn, you can deal 1d4 damage to any creature that you're grappling. That's not a ton of damage, but it is automatic, so that's a nice little bump. More on grappling later. At level 5, we would be a fighter 2. We get action surge, of course, one of the strongest abilities in the game, and I'm kind of getting sick of it. <laughs> Once per short rest with action surge, you get two actions instead of one on your turn. Infinitely useful. At level six, we would be a fighter three, and we get our martial archetype, our fighter subclass. And we're gonna go with Rune Knight. So apparently our mountain dwarf, a apprenticed under giants at some point in their career, or maybe at this point in your career if you get some downtime. Perhaps you are seeking their wisdom or to learn from their strength. Perhaps you are testing yourself in battle against a giant and wound up getting captured by them, where you ended up perhaps making friends over a period of time and you learned their rune carving craft. Rune Knight is probably my favorite fighter subclass, I think. It brings some fun utility and variety to what can sometimes be a little bit of a boring, if powerful, class, in my opinion. Not only that, but I think it's probably one of the best subclasses, generally speaking, for sustained damage for fighters, and heaven knows we could use all the help we could get there. More importantly, I think, for a character who's planning on doing a fair bit of grappling, it gives us some nice advantages there. So, as a rune knight, we get the rune carver feature. You learn two runes of your choice from a nice little list, and then you inscribe them to something that you're wearing or holding in your hand. Yikes. <laughs> We don't have a lot of options. One rune in my fashionable leather bracers and another in my loincloth. Um, my favorite runes for this character would be Cloud and Frost, I think. Cloud rune is just incredible. As a reaction with Cloud rune, when you get hit by an attack, you can choose a different creature within 30 feet of you other than the attacker and have the attack go against that creature instead with the same attack roll. Even if it's a melee attack and the creature's 30 feet away, it still works. And I'm smiling because I actually used this in the one shot that I did with the dungeon dudes and triant monk uh, last week to 
what I thought was really cool and hilarious effect. If you haven't seen that, by the way, I'll put a little link there. Yeah, I did a collaboration one-shot video with Dungeon Dudes of Treehouse Monk. It was awesome. It was a lot of fun. I was being attacked by a spellcaster that was trying to hit me and then plane shift me into the far realm, and instead I used Cloud Rune to make it hit their ally, and so, and the attack landed and and they plane shifted their ally to the far realm. <laughs> ah, it was so cool. But anyway, yes, Cloud Rune, I mean, it can turn critical hits against you into critical hits against an enemy, for example, as well. Just, um, you know, there's no save or anything against it. It just works really strong. As for the second rune, you know, typically I tend to prefer Fire Rune as my second rune on Rune Knights, but Fire Rune specifically states that you have to hit a creature with a weapon to invoke it. And even though unarmed strikes are considered melee weapon attacks, they're not actually considered weapons, rules as written. It's a little confusing and weird, I know. If you can use Fire Rune with your fists at your table, then go ahead and consider it. But actually, for this character, I think, Frost gives us a plus two bonus to all ability checks and saving throws that use strength or constitution for 10 minutes when we invoke it as a bonus action. That's kind of a bummer because we are going to be pretty bonus action heavy, but this is great for both defense and also for grapple checks. So I think on this character, I'm probably going frost. And then just keep in mind, you can use each of your runes once per short rest and then they'll reset. The other really great feature with rune knights here at level three fighter is Giant's Might, which lets us proficiency bonus times per day, and as a bonus action, grow to large size, get advantage on strength checks and saving throws, which admittedly we already had when raging, so a little bit of a potential redundancy bummer there. But then once per turn, one of our attacks with a weapon or unarmed strike can deal an extra d6 of damage. All right, so at level six, it is time for our first damage report, and I want to discuss tactics. The way I imagine combat for this character would be something like this. Round one, rage is a bonus action, then run up to a deadly, preferably melee enemy, I think, and grapple them. Let's discuss grappling. To grapple an enemy, you use one of your attacks with your attack action, of which we only have one currently, and make an athletics check against the enemy's athletics or acrobatics check, their choice. Uh, so make sure you take athletics as one of your starting proficiencies from either your class or your background. But remember, to grapple them, they can only be one size larger than you or smaller. This is why the Rune Knight's Giant Smite feature is so important for this character, as it would potentially let you grow and then grapple creatures that are huge or smaller, right? Also, remember that you have advantage on your strength checks, and athletics is a strength check, so it qualifies. And you could potentially get a plus two bonus there from Frost Rune if you felt like you were going to be going up against a particular strong or nimble enemy. But if you win this contest, which you most likely will, the enemy is grappled, which simply means that their speed is reduced to zero. From this point on, what you do is up to you. On your next turn, if you wanted, you could use Giant's Might as a bonus action, right? We're talking round two here. Again, bummer that we're so bonus action heavy, but for an extra D6 of damage on your attacks, or you could simply start punching and headbutting your grappled enemy. You could actually go grapple a second enemy. With grapple, you only need one free arm in order to grapple, so you could potentially grapple two. Get two of them in headlocks there. And, you know, if you needed to, if the, the other enemy was 10 feet away or whatever, you can drag a grappled enemy at half your move speed. And then maybe bonus action, unarmed strike one of them. Remember, unarmed strikes don't have to be with your fist. You could have two enemies grappled and just headbutt one of them, right? Or, you know, knee them or something like that. You could actually also take the shove attack for your attack action and knock the enemy that you have grappled prone if you similarly succeed on an athletics check against their acro acrobatics or athletics. And then if the enemy is prone, it means that they can't stand up since a grappled enemy's move speed is zero. And thus, while prone, melee attacks against them have advantage from you and from your allies. So that might mean you wouldn't have to use reckless attacks and potentially increase your survivability. And then again, your other melee allies would have advantage on this enemy as well. Doing all of those things, right, means that you're not going to be doing as much damage as you could be, of course. So it's a decision that you're going to have to make. Do you want to hurt them more or control them? Grab one enemy and start pummeling or grab two? Grab one, knock it prone, and then start attacking? The reality is, like I said at the beginning, our damage per round isn't going to be particularly phenomenal, even if we just come out swinging. So depending on your party, 
depending on your enemy, you might want to go one route or another, right? Depending on the combat situation. And frankly, I love that. I love having options. I'm not going to tell you the best thing to do. I'm just going to crunch the numbers for the best case scenario DPR and let you decide. Best case scenario damage per round for our character currently is to have at least one enemy grappled so that we get that extra d4 of damage from the unarmed fighting style. Have both our rage and our giant smite active, which I appreciate. Both require a bonus action and have limited uses. And then make two unarmed strikes against our grappled enemy. One as an action, one with our bonus action granted us by martial arts, both of which are made with advantage thanks to reckless attack or having an enemy that's both grappled and shoved, I guess, both of which hit for a d8 plus three for strength plus two for rage with the first attack that lands doing an extra d6 of damage thanks to giant's might. Under the above scenario, we're potentially doing one d4 plus one d6 plus two d8 plus 10 total damage right? And so against an enemy with a 10 armor class here, that would mean 26 damage per round on average. And against an enemy with a 15 armor class, that would be 23 damage per round on average. All right. So it's not the worst DPR of any sustained damage build that I've done, but it's close. The only build it beats out at this level is the Blood Hunter Mutant I did, which actually scales a lot better than this does. So this is why I've been saying that we need to be doing something other than just punching stuff with this character. The damage is respectable, right? Better than someone, say, just casting Eldritch Blast with the Agonizing Blast invocation on their turn, or like a sword and shield fighter swinging a longsword a couple of times, etc. But it's it's not super potent, right? Uh, but it's not it's not an amazing striker, right? So sure. If you wanted to, instead of taking all of those rounds to grapple and drag and shove, etc., you could just come out swinging. And there will be plenty of times in your character's career when that will be the best thing to do. But in my personal opinion, your party is generally going to be best off with you getting in there and being the scrappy brawler that you are. Put someone in a headlock, give them a nice knee to the face, maybe grab someone else and do the same. Now you have two enemies under your control and your backline more fragile party members are gonna be a lot safer. Shove one or maybe both of them to the ground and now your melee allies who might hit harder than you are going to have advantage on their attacks. Meanwhile, you've probably got resistance to the damage that the enemy's doing. They're probably going to be attacking you since they can't get to others easily and you're getting in a fair number of shots while you're at it. That I think is how I would play this character and honestly, I think it would be both powerful and a heck of a lot of fun despite the somewhat moderate damage numbers. And to be fair, we will actually see some decent scaling to those damage numbers from here. Okay, at level seven, we would be a fighter four and we get our first ability score increase or feat. I'm gonna recommend that we bump our strength score since it adds to everything that we're trying to do, both grapple and damage. I think we need to prioritize strength above all else. At level eight, we would be a fighter five and we finally get extra attack. This is especially nice since both grapple and shove take one of our attacks when we take the attack action, but we could grapple and shove an enemy in a single turn now if we want it or even grapple one drag them over to their friend and grapple a second right or grapple punch them bonus action punch them etc at level nine we would be a fighter six and we get another ability score increase or feat thank goodness for fighters that can make up for all the early multi-classing that we did so that right here at level nine we can have our strength score capped at 20. And it's already time for another damage report. We've had some really nice gains since our last check. Uh, we've got another attack per turn and a capped strength score. So against an enemy with 10 armor class, we would be doing 42 damage per round on average. And against an enemy with a 16 armor class, it would be a 39 DPR. And man, we've almost doubled our damage since at the last check in just three short levels, right? Compared to other sustained DPR builds now that I've done, and by the way, if you wanna check the comparisons, I put them all in spreadsheets and graphs, just look in the video description below for links. Compared to others right now, we're about in the middle of the pack versus other tier three builds. And that's probably about as good as it's going to get for this character when compared to other sustained DPR characters throughout our career. This is kind of our brawler's golden age, so I hope you enjoy it. 
At level 10, now that we have our strength score capped and that extra attack that we've been wanting, I want to dip back into Barbarian for, for a couple of reasons. First of all, we get a third rage use per day. Arguably, you should have done this long ago if you're consistently seeing more than two combat encounters per day. We don't actually at my table, typically on average. I felt a little less bad about not getting that third rage because we also had our giant's might several times per day, and that similarly gets you advantage on strength saves and checks, so you might want to like stagger those or use one one time and another another time, but Giant's Might doesn't give us damage resistance or an extra two damage per attack that we make, so take Barbarian 3 earlier in your career if you really need it. But I also wanted to get a Barbarian subclass for a little damage increase, and Zealot is my favorite for that purpose. I can definitely see going, say, like Bear Totem Barbarian here if you want, if you find yourself taking a lot of damage outside of Bludgeoning, Piercing, and Slashing, because Bear Totem gives you resistance to all damage except Psychic, or even maybe Wolf Totem if you want to give your allies more reliable advantage. Ancestral Guardian would be fun if you didn't necessarily want to grapple a lot, but still wanted to help protect your allies. But I'm going to go Zealot. So it looks like our champion has found religion in their travels. Uh, perhaps like one of your cleric companions has been teaching you their ways. Perhaps you had like a near-death experience or even died in battle, I think, but were brought back with divine aid. As always, I would plan ahead and work these things out with your DM and possibly even the other players at your table beforehand to craft the best story arc for your character as you play. But as a zealot barbarian, we get Divine Fury, which tells us that while we are raging, the first creature we hit on our turn with a weapon attack, and remember, unarmed strikes count here, they take an extra 1d6 plus half of our barbarian level in necrotic or radiant damage, and we choose necrotic or radiant when we gain this feature. So it's the same every time from that point on. I would probably recommend going radiant but it's a nice little damage bump. We also get Warrior of the Gods. I love Warrior of the Gods a lot. If someone has to resurrect us from death with a like raise dead or revivify spell, etc., they can do so without the very expensive material components. I've always been a fan of glass cannon, high risk, high reward characters, as most of you probably know by now, and this just takes the shackles off a teeny bit, I think, letting you really throw caution to the wind with even greater abandon, and I just, I love it for that. At level 11, we would be a fighter 7. I think we're going back to fighter probably for, well, almost the rest of our career. So as a rune knight at fighter 7, we learn runic shield, which lets us use our reaction to force an enemy to re-roll when they hit an ally with an attack within 60 feet of us. Being able to use this after the attack hits is nice, though they do have to use that second roll no matter what it is, and I have a feeling that at least once in your career, you're going to inadvertently turn a regular hit into a critical hit against your ally, and that's going to be both hilarious and awesome, and will also make you feel bad while you're laughing. Now, you can do this proficiency bonus times per day, so between this and your reaction-based runes, you've got a lot of great ways to use your reaction with really big benefits to your entire party because, yes, I said runes. As a rune knight at Fighter 7, you get a third rune, and I think I would go here with the Storm Rune option, which wasn't available until we hit Fighter 7, by the way. Storm is fabulous. As a bonus action, you can invoke the rune to enter a prophetic state for one minute, and thereafter you can use your reaction every single round to cause an attack, ability check, or saving throw made by you or another creature to have advantage or disadvantage. Holy cow. That's great for you, that's great for your friends, it's great for your cow, terrible for your enemies. So at this point, you know, between runic shield and your awesome reaction-based runes, you should probably be using your reaction every single round of combat, or nearly so, for one of the fantastic abilities available to you. At level 12, we would be a fighter 8, we get another ability score increase or feat, and I think I would probably go with a bump to my constitution here. It increases both our hit points and our armor class, of course, thanks to unarmored defense. And remember, since we typically take half damage on most of the damage that we're going to be seeing, every hit point for us is almost as good as two hit points on a non-rager. At level 13, we'd be a fighter nine, 
and we would get Indomitable. Indomitable lets us reroll a saving throw that we failed once per day. Um, it's an okay feature. It, uh, you know, I wouldn't use it if you failed, say, an intelligent saving throw here, because you're probably gonna just fail it again anyway. But on a dexterity or like constitution or strength saving throw, sure, go ahead. All right, at level 13, time for another damage report, and we have plateaued quite a bit. Really, all we've added is the 1d6 plus one once per round to our damage, right, from uh, from Zealot Barbarian. We have picked up, though, some really nice utility and defensive features, however. Hopefully you're seeing, like, some quality magic items by now to help you overcome the widening gap between your damage and your allies who are really focused on hurting bad guys with probably weapons or spells. So, against an enemy with a 10 armor class at this level, we would, on average, do 47. DPR, and against an enemy with a 17 armor class, it would be 44 DPR. That puts us back near the bottom of the group compared to other tier 3 sustained DPR builds, but hey, like I say often, right, all of these builds were created to try to maximize sustained DPR, so at least we're hanging with them, if barely, at this level beating out only my poor little munger the monk ranger build that i did way back in the day my first monk ever give, give the munger some love it wasn't it wasn't a bad character in fact they did pretty decent damage uh, up through kind of mid game but anyway listen we're doing a lot right now to not only control our enemies but also protect our allies so you are bringing a lot to the table here and some decent damage right at level 14 you would be a fighter 10 and we get, as a rune knight, great stature. This means that we actually physically and permanently grow 3d4 inches in height. Or, I guess, like 6d4 centimeters for the non-US viewers out there. And that's kind of fun. But then our giant's might damage increases to a 1d8. So, one more damage on average. Once per turn. <sighs> I wish someone would teach Wizards of the Coast about scaling sometimes. We do get a fourth rune here as well, and our choices are basically between hill rune and stone rune. Hill is nothing but redundant for us, and stone is actually really, really good, and something I almost took way back at the beginning, but decided that frost was just a little more important for our grapple checks. Anyway, Stone Rune is nice in that it lets us use our reaction yet again, but this time forcing a creature to make a wisdom saving throw against our constitution modified DC, not strength unfortunately, but our con is still pretty good, or the enemy is charmed and incapacitated for a minute. That's really strong against low wisdom enemies in particular. At level 15, we would be a fighter 11. And this is actually the main reason why I decided way back when to go with Fighter as my main class, because yes, we get extra, extra attack. I mean, sure, the ability score increases were nice, the Rune Knight features were really great too, but compared to Monk and Barbarian, this gives us a nice late game bump to our damage that the other two just don't see, frankly. So yeah, now when we take the attack action, we can attack three times, plus our bonus action, unarmed strike, potentially. That is a lot of punching and kicking and headbutting and grappling and shoving in a turn. And sure, like I said, Monk could arguably have gotten four unarmed strikes per turn as early as level five, but again, that was only going to be five rounds per short rest. And we've already gone over all the reasons why I didn't want to make another monk build here. So at level 16, we would be a fighter 12. We get another ability score increase or feat. I'm going to say, let's just go ahead and cap that constitution, uh, adding even more to our survivability. And then finally for us at level 17, I think at level 17, I probably go back to barbarian actually in the end, since that would make us a barbarian four and would give us one more ability score increase or feat. And had we gone on to Fighter 13, that's just another use of Indomitable, which I don't love as much. Barbarian 4 would let us then, as an ASI, bump our dexterity, further increasing our armor class, not to mention our saving throws and our initiative, among other things. I suppose if I were going to play this character all the way to 20, I'd probably just stick with Fighter, at least to get to Fighter 15 so that I can invoke my runes twice per short rest, which would be amazing. But... I always get off the train at 17, so 
there you are. Oh, and by the way, some of you are probably wondering why I never took Tavern Brawler on this character as a feat, I'm guessing. Um, I think thematically Tavern Brawler fits perfectly, but mechanically it just doesn't really do a lot for us. The, the plus one to strength or constitution is nice, but I would rather have a plus two to strength or constitution as an ability score increase versus like the other things that we would get from the feat. We don't need the d4 for our unarmed strikes. Grappling as a bonus action is kind of nice, but I almost feel like we're more bonus action heavy than we are action heavy on this character. And I don't imagine using improvised weapons all that much, but you know, if you think it a better choice, feel free to take it at some point along the path. For our final damage report, then we have picked up a fourth attack on our turn, a little bump to our giant's might damage, and a lot better defense. And thus, against an enemy with a 10 armor class, we would on average do 61 DPR, and against an enemy with an 18 armor class, it doesn't drop much, just a 57 damage per round. And you know what? I'm gonna be honest, that's actually better than I thought we'd be by level 17 when I first started making this build. Um, now, we are still near the bottom of tier three builds compared to others at this level, but we're still not quite bringing up the rear. And so, yeah, I'm pleased. I am, and I will discuss why in the final thoughts. So the final tier score, for this character, when you average the damage versus all enemy ACs at each of our damage reports, comes in at the pretty lowly score of 40, which just beats out the mounted battlesmith hmm. <laughs> to avoid last place. And so, sure, on the one hand, it feels fairly clear that Wizards of the Coast just doesn't really like unarmed strikers. Like I said, had we gone Monk, we could have had that fourth attack semi-reliably by level 7 or 8, plus magical attacks if you needed them, but we would have had fewer hit points, no giant smite damage, fewer ways to protect our allies, a crappy wisdom score for bad monk features, fewer ability score increases, etc. I just don't think it was the way to go with this character. But here's why I'm actually really pleased with the way that this character turned out. This character is a true bruiser. They're tough to kill, they do okay damage, they provide a lot of nice control and defensive abilities for their allies. You know what they actually remind me of? A top laner in the video game League of Legends. I feel like I, I plug League of, League of Legends a lot, that's not really my intention, but I don't know if there's a lot of fans out there of the game, and I actually haven't played for years, but for those who don't know, you know, the, the, the way the game works is you have a team of five and one of the characters goes in the top lane, and usually the character you would choose to go into the top lane would be just this like annoying, really durable type character who wouldn't necessarily do crazy damage but could pack a solid punch, but then also just outlast everyone. They brought a lot of utility and or support to the team as well. And something tells me that those of you who were interested in building this bruiser, brawler, scrapper, strength-based bare-knuckle boxer are, are probably those who would find that type of playstyle a lot of fun, right? I know I think it would be a blast. You just wade into battle with nothing but your fists, and you just make life such a freaking pain for your enemies. You got spit in your eye and gravel in your gut. You're not flashy, you don't need to cast the most awesome spells or dance around your enemies with grace and steel. You grab them, you throw them to the ground, you hold them down, and you get in some cheap shots while you're at it. You laugh as they're trying to hurt you, and meanwhile throw out a bunch of protective and defensive buffs to your allies, and maybe debuffs to other enemies. You might not hit the hardest, but you are definitely going to be the most annoying character on the battlefield for your enemies. And you're probably going to be the MVP in most fights, all things considered. A true heavyweight champion, indeed. And that would make this character a blast to play. So, that's the build for the week. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, I love you very much. So, thank you so much for watching. Thanks for all of your support. Um, I hope you'll check out the other content in the channel. And uh, do all of the liking and subscribing things that, you're suppo that I'm supposed to tell you to do. Mostly, I hope that you have a fantastic day and a fantastic week. And that I'll see you again really soon. So, until then, take care. Bye.
Let's get ready to rumble. No. <laughs> no, that's a little bit. That's a little bit too much, right? That's too much. Rising up back on the street. Took my time, took my chances. I got something in my eye. Hold, please. Indomitable. Indom indubitably. In <laughs> Indomit in <laughs> Indomitable. It hurts, mama. Why is my laptop being so loud? Can you hear that? Can you guys hear that? It's like... You just go in there with nothing but the shirt on your back, or maybe not even that, actually. Um, <laughs> didn't I already say this? No, I already said that. Never mind. Don't, don't say that, actually. Don't say that. I don't even need to say that. Um, so yeah, don't say that. Don't say that. Eh, uh, don't say that. I probably don't need to say that. Anyway, don't say that. <laughs> Here I am. I'm like a pimp for my character builds. And he's watching us all with the eye do, 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 of the tiger.